Hey everyone, and welcome to our October live event for National Sewing Circle. Uh, we once again have the fabulous Nikki LaFoyle here to answer all of your sewing questions. So thanks for being here, Nikki. Hi, thank you for having me again. Of course. So we're going to get started right away with a question uh, that I think is a good one to start with. And someone says they're interested in sewing, but they don't have any ideas of where to start. Uh, can you give them some tips? Yeah, that's um, kind of an intimidating place to start is um, how do you jump in? Because there's there's so much information out there. Where do you start? Um, you can start uh, by just picking a project that you want to sew and look up tutorials for that and kind of learn as you go. Or you can kind of start at the bottom and work your way your work your way up. Look for some beginner sewing lessons and. Um, National Sewing Circle, of course, is a great re resource. Um, they have a ton of videos on almost every subject you could um, want to look up. So um, explore that. And um, sewitalltv.com and sewitallmag.com are both geared toward beginners. So they have a lot of great beginner projects. Um, I believe free. Um, if you noodle around those web pages, you can find some of those. Um, so you can kind of look around at those resources and build your skills uh, as you go. And um, uh, you can find, there's a ton of sewing bloggers out there as well. So um, you can do some searches for, uh, if you type in beginner sewing lessons, um, just in your search bar, or you can go to youtube.com and there's a lot of resources out there um, on YouTube for sewing lessons. Uh, Vanessa Wilson, actually, she's called the Crafty Chica. She has a great YouTube channel. She does a lot of quilting um, and a lot of sewing for kids, I believe. Uh, so she has a lot of great tutorials. Um, but you can just kind of take the first step. I know the first step is the hardest, but um, just click on a link to get a beginner sewing lesson, and that'll get the ball rolling. Absolutely. And then once you try something, it's just going to make you want to keep going and try more things. Definitely. All right, and speaking of kids, we have a question here that comes from Susan. And she says that she tutors several fifth and sixth grade girls after school, and they have recently asked her to teach them how to sew. Can you help her find information to make this fun and productive for the girls? Definitely. I think that's so great that they asked you to learn how to sew. That's so fun. It's great when it comes from them that they want to learn. Um, some people will recommend starting kids out sewing on an actual machine, but I think it's it's probably best, especially if you have, if you have a class of kids, to start out with hand sewing, uh, less danger that way. Um, and you'll wanna get them a larger hand sewing needle. Um, you know, their little hands are kinda hard to, it's kinda hard for them to handle anything small and really delicate. So something big like a tapestry needle with a big eye and, um, some thicker thread, like um, in hand embroidery thread, um, to get them started. Um, it's fun for kids to, if you let them pick out their own fabric, so if you bring in like a, a stack of fabric and let them choose their own print, that can give them some ownership over it and get them excited about the project. Um, it's nice for kids if you start them out, you know, draw a line for them to sew on. It's good for kids to have guidelines for everything to sew um, right on a, on, on a line. Um, some hand sewing projects that are fun, um, since you've got a large needle and large thread, you'll need a fabric that can accommodate that, so felt or fleece or something with a more open weave. Um, and uh, let's see, Sew Mama Sew has some great tips and projects for kids. Um, SewMamaSew.com, you can search kids and you can find some projects. And also Sew-SEW-Easy.com um, has some fun and easy projects for kids as well, such as a pillowcase, that's a great kind of small project for kids. Um, headbands, uh, little felt monsters that kids can cut out different colors of felt and do like sew eyes on and stuff them with fiber fill. That's a fun project for kids. Um, but make sure you've got safety scissors for kids um, and um, do a lot of repetition. So 
um, repeat the lessons a lot and um, you, you can, you know, if they want to do the project again and again, that's a good thing. Um, and actually, Vanessa Wilson, who I just mentioned, um, she was on Sew It All TV episode 701. So you can go to sewitalltv.com and look her up. She's got a list of tips for sewing for kids and instructions to make a pillowcase. So um, you can check out those resources and come up with something fun for the kiddos. Perfect. All right, we've got a couple questions coming in here already. And the first one here is from Jeanette. And she says, when I use a serger to sew a circular part, like the end of a sleeve, what is the best way to end the seam? Do I have to serge over the beginning? Yes, I usually do. I would serge about an inch over the beginning and then uh, veer your seam off just to make sure you've captured that, that end in the seam. Do you then just trim it off or do you use some sort of um, seam finishing, uh, anything like that to finish uh, it off? Since the, the ending of the chain stitches crossed over the beginning, that kind of locks it into place. So I just trim those off and you don't really need to lock it with anything else. Perfect. All right. She actually has another question also about finishing things. And she says, when I sew bias tape, how is the best way to end to have a nice finish? How do you join the beginning of the bias tape with the end? It's a good question. Yeah, the finishing is the hardest part on when you're binding something, in my opinion. Um, so you can use a, um, a, a diagonal seam when you're finishing binding you know, to join the ends together. That makes a nice um, kind of inconspicuous joining and it's not super bulky. Um, so when you start your binding, you want to leave yourself a really generous uh, portion um, unstitched. And then at the end of the binding, you want to do the same thing, leave yourself a kind of a generous portion unstitched. Um, and uh, fold one piece uh, up and fold the other piece over it so that you can see where they're gonna join and make a, yourself a mark. Um, it's kind of hard to like uh, give you a visual. Let me see, I know I have this bookmark so I wanna give you a um, continuous binding. Um, I wanna give you a website to go to so you have um, visuals. Well, while you're looking for that, you know I just have to be the one that uh, points out National Sewing Circle, as well as we have a, a sister site, uh, National Quilter Circle, and there's all sorts of information about binding on that as well. Sometimes it's, it's more common to find binding information on quilting sites uh, than on sewing sites sometimes. Absolutely. Um, the Shop Martingale blog actually has a tutorial on that. Um, but basically you are um, finding where those ends will join and fold it so that the binding, um, one is lying this way and one is lying that way. You do it diagonally and then you stitch across so that you get a diagonal seam. I don't have a, I was yep. looking around for something to like demonstrate, but I don't have any bi uh, binding strips laying around right now. It'd be the same way as if you were making your, your binding and you're, you're putting them together to actually make a big long piece of binding. It's the same, same sort of uh, scene that you'd be doing for that as well. So if you've made a long strip of binding, just do the same thing one more time. Exactly. Perfect. All right, we have another question here that came in and this is from Linda. And she says, what is the secret to monogramming a cubby so it is straight instead of slanted? Straight instead of slanted. Um, I'm wondering if we can get a little bit of follow up on this. Is in like a cubby for? I'm picturing like those little uh, fabric boxes that go into like bookshelves and stuff. Is that the kind of cubby we're maybe referring to? Um, yeah, for getting anything s straight um, when embroidering, it's I feel like it's all in the preparation, um, marking your center. Um, the center of the design on the fabric and making sure it's straight in the hoop. If I'm understanding that correctly. Yep. So yeah, if you can, uh, Linda, if you want to tell us what kind of cubby you're working with, maybe we can give you a little bit further explanation on that one. Um, our next question here is from Barbara. 
And she says, I will be teaching at a senior citizen center in January, three different sewing classes. One will be mending without a sewing machine, beginning sewing for those that don't know what a needle is, and sewing for the novice. My question is, do you know of any supplies or equipment that seniors could use uh, for physical issues like vision, uh, handshaking, things like that? Um, I know that there are um, glasses that you can wear that, I'm not sure if the lenses are magnified or if they're just glasses or, but there's like a light that can clip on to the glasses. Um, I don't have a product name, but I know I've seen those and that can help a lot. Um, as far as like shaking and um, like threading needles, I'm not sure other than just, you know, the regular um, little needle threaders that you see on the end of the seam rippers. Um, those can help. I know the, the sewing birds um, can help sometimes. Those are the clips that will clip something to your um, your table or your board so that you have a hand free. That can sometimes help. Um, if anybody else has any suggestions, um, yeah. those would be Absolutely. And I think you might even be able to find information just sort of um, searching like specifically what you're looking for. So sewing products for vision impaired or something like that may be able to, to give you a better list of, because I'm sure someone out there has also taught classes uh, like this oh. as well. All right. Our next question here is from Lori. And she says, She'd like to know if a class for a one-handed seamstress exists. Classes. As far as classes, I'm not really sure. I couldn't find a class, but there's some information. I actually Googled sewing one-handed, and there's a blog called The Single-Handed Life, thesinglehandedlife.blogspot.com, and um, you can search sewing and quilting um, in there, and... Um, she has some um, some tips for sewing one-handed, and then what's cool is um, a lot of other people have commented on that blog and given their thoughts and their tips uh, for sewing one-handed. And there's also a thread on um, PatternReview.com. So it's sewing.PatternReview.com, and um, the thread is one-handed sewing, and a lot of people there as well have um, have commented on the things that they have done to help them um, when sewing one-handed. So I couldn't find a class, but there's some information out there, some tips from other people who have gone through that. So you can check that out and see if any of those tips could help. Perfect. All right, we have an update on what a cubby is, and I could not have been more wrong. It turns out <laughs> that a cubby is a stuffed animal. Um, and she says she can't get it straight in the hoop no matter what she does. Um, when I'm finishing, the name is not straight. The stuffed animals blanks, right. <laughs> Wouldn't have guessed. I never would have guessed that. Um, I've never done one of those. I've seen those completed. Um, it seems like it would be hard to get them, like, on the hoop and straight. Um, maybe try uh, marking... The, the center crosshairs on the cubby and um, marking it, you know, on your interfacing on your hoop <clears throat> or your stabilizer in your hoop maybe. Um, that could help. Um, and when you get those lines matched up, um, I know pinning things into the hoop is kind of dangerous, but make sure you're pinning outside of the embroidery area. Um, or, you know, there's clips to hold him, clips to hold things to the hoop, um, uh, temporary spray adhesive to try to get him to stay on the, the cross marks. Um, those are just some ideas. I've never done it, though. Hey, yeah, I guess I, I, whatever you could do to make it sure it doesn't shift while you're embroidering yeah. as long as you have it lined up to to start with maybe that will that will help so i'm definitely a fan of the the spray adhesive because i'm i'm scared of the pins in there yeah. <laughs> all right our next question here we have we have a lot of questions that came in early uh, about sewing machines different issues with sewing machines and a lot of people looking to get new machines so this question is from cindy and she says that she has a very old sewing machine and would like to have a new one she does basic sewing, but would like some additional features that would enhance projects. 
Any suggestions as to certain brands or models of machines that are both easy to use and easy to maintain? Yeah, uh, that's a tricky question sometimes because everybody has their own opinions on what machine you should use and people, once they start on a machine, you know, they love that brand and they've got loyalty to that brand. Um, I always recommend shopping around a little bit um, to find what would be right for you. So you can go to some dealers and test drive some machines. Um, uh, my little brother back here is the Brother CS6000i, and it's uh, relatively inexpensive. It's got the zigzag stitch, straight stitch, uh, buttonhole, which is mostly what I use. Sometimes I use the triple uh, triple stretch stitch, um, and it's got some decorative stitches too when I'm feeling fancy. So it does everything that I need it to do. Um, it hasn't really given me too many problems. Um, and on Amazon, it, it's one of the top sellers simply because it is so inexpensive, and um, you know a lot of people like that about it. Um, but I've worked on a lot of Foff machines and baby locks and um, those are they're all good machines. Um, you can go on their websites as well and compare features of the different models. Um, a lot of the, the machine websites, the machine company websites will have prices, but I know uh, baby lock, Husqvarna Viking, and Foff don't put the prices on their websites, so you'd have to call a dealer or go in um, to find a pricing on that but um, yeah go kind of taking the time to go around and uh, shop around and test drive some um, would be worth it to you in the end I think uh, to figure out um, exactly the right machine the right features that uh, you would like to have absolutely and as far as uh, maintaining machines I mean I, I I have a brother machine as well and I've never really had any issues as far as needing to take it in or um, do any major maintenance to it, just some basic cleaning? Is that all you do to your machine as well? Yeah. Um, I'm pretty infrequently, probably more infrequently than I should. Um, just every couple months do a little cleaning, uh, and I haven't run into any problems. No, perfect. Okay. All right, our next question here is from Kathleen, and she says, I want to make some curtains using those large grommets. Do you have any tips? Um, yeah, so for large grommets, um, you just want to make sure that you're um, placing them far enough away from your edges. Um, and when you, so when you mark the grommet, you're marking the very center of the center hole. So make sure you've got enough room on each side. Um, and make sure you're using an even number of grommets on each curtain so that the, ed, the each end will point inward. Um, I think larger grommets you want to place um, like two to two and a half inches from the edge, uh, from each end, to get kind of a good flow. Um, but yeah, the the snap-on grommets have instructions uh, on the package too on exactly how to use them, so they're kind of great that way. Yeah, absolutely. I think the uh... The one thing that um, I know I messed up the first time using grommets is make sure you cut the right size hole because uh, too small, it's not going to go in and too big, it just goes right through. So <laughs> definitely right. making sure you have the, the hole cut the right size is probably the best um, thing to get right the first time. Uh, <laughs> uh, we have another question here that just came in from Mirline and she says she has the same machine that you do and what number do you normally keep your tension on? My tension is actually usually pretty high, even when sewing um, like just regular quilting cottons. So mine is on a six right now. Um, and I could probably go in and mess with my bobbin tension a little bit and get that needle tension in a more uh, mid-range, but uh, it seems to be working fine for me. Um, when I switch to something thicker like a faux leather, I I don't usually have to change it all that much, so it sits between like five and seven. Um, but it is, it does for me stay a little bit higher than the the normal. I know there's like a a marking on that tension dial that says four should be like your mid range, but yeah, mine sits at about a a six, and 
uh, it works fine. No problems. Yep. I think my little tension dial from four to six is my little recommended area. So anywhere in there, probably pretty good. All right. We have another question here about machines. Um, this is from Maria. And she says, I'm having trouble with the tension on my sewing machine. The thread keeps breaking and also bunching up on the back side of the material. That is a very common question and a common issue. So thread breakage can be caused for a number of reasons. So if your tensions are too tight, um, your, your seam may look balanced, but if your thread tension and your bobbin tension are too tight, that can cause just too much pressure on the seam and that can cause thread breakage a lot of times. Um, if you have the, the wrong combination of thread and needle, Sometimes that can put too much friction on the thread and you'll get a lot of breakage. So if the, the eye of your needle is too small for your thread, um, that can give you that problem. So if you're using like a top stitch thread or a heavyweight thread, you want to make sure you have a needle that has a larger eye, such as a top stitch needle or a jeans needle. Um, and of course, first of all, make sure you, the, the machine is threaded correctly. Um, and that should alleviate your thread nests, but if not, make sure your bobbin is inserted correctly as well. Uh, make sure your needle is uh, new and sharp and not dull. Um, that can cause thread nests a lot of times. Um, <clears throat> that's kind of the major things. Uh, make sure your machine is clean and free of lint. Um, uh, bobbin case tension being too loose can sometimes cause thread nests, but um, that's kind of rare. Uh, if your presser foot is up, that will cause thread, thread nests as well. We've all done it, left the presser foot up and tried to sew. Um, that, that's the one error code that I know on my machine. It's E6. Like that's the one <laughs> that when it goes off, I know I need to put my, my presser okay. foot down. Uh, yeah, so if you try all those things, um, that should alleviate those problems. That, that's my checklist. All right, we have another question here that was about a sewing machine issue that I've never actually heard of before, so I'm excited to see how you're going to answer it. Uh, but this is from Gil, and they say that their daughter borrowed their sewing machine, and when I use it, I always finish off by drawing the stitch through and tying it off. However, she did something that I didn't know you could do, which was sew backwards. Since she has done this, I cannot get the machine to sew forwards. I would like my machine back in the state that she borrowed it in, so what do I have to do to release it so it now sews properly? Yeah, so that sounds like your your back stitch button got stuck or um, on on a lot of machines it's it's different. On mine it's a little button that looks like a it's a curved um, line with an arrow at the end for your back stitch and I just press it once and it does one back stitch and then it automatically reverts to stitching forward but on some it's a lever that you flip so you can check your manual to see uh, look at look for the back stitch um, options in your manual and hopefully that'll tell you how to to switch that back um, or you can also type in your search bar the type of machine you have the model and back stitch um, and hopefully that'll bring up some some options for you but it sounds like it's either a flip that you just need to switch back or maybe it's jammed in some way um, but yeah that's you gotta get that back stitch turned off it would be nice to, <laughs> to not go so forward yeah <laughs> that would be a whole new skill you don't really want to have to have is to sew backwards all right our next question here is from Betty and she wants to know is there a tutorial for altering men's pants from a size 50 to 42 where the top part of the pants can be taken off by taking can be taken up by taking the band off and not having to replace the back pockets. Um, I'm sure there are tutorials out there. I'm sure tutorials exist for that. Um, I would I would search keywords um, men's pants, uh, alter men's pants, or take in men's pants and um, there's a lot of information out there about about alterations, mm -hmm. um, altering ready to wear. Um, I don't know of any off the top of my head to point you to. I'm sorry, but um, if you do a search, I bet you could find something for sure. Absolutely. 
All right, um, speaking of patterns and pattern alterations, uh, Faye wants to know, how do I size a pattern for the smallness of my shoulders with the wideness of my tummy? Yeah, so I've got my, my little quarter size patterns that I figured out. I'm like, how can I teach people about pattern alterations? Or a little tiny pieces. <laughs> um, so if you have narrow shoulders, um, that's a pretty easy alteration to do. You can just take this point in and put it wherever you need to. Take that up um, however much you need to bring that up for your shoulder. Um, and then true that line into the arm side curve. And whatever you do to the front pattern, make sure you do to the back as well so that shoulder seam will still sew together nicely. Um, and that will make your arm's eye a little bit larger, but your sleeve cap will generally have uh, enough um, ease in it that it'll still fit in there just fine. Um, if it doesn't, if there's not enough ease in that cap, you'll just slash down the center of your your sleeve pattern and open it up, uh, pivot it out as much as you need to add to the to sleeve cap to make that um, even again. Um, and then to widen out for your tummy, if you've got a dart there, you can just ignore that dart and that automatically will give you a little bit more space in the tummy area. Or for this side seam, you can just bring that out. A lot of times in, um, in shirt patterns, there will be a little you know, a curve there for your waist. You can just bring that a little out a little bit more, straighten out that curve um, to give a little bit more, um, more fullness, more area uh, for the circ circumference of your waistline. Um, and again, whatever you do to the front pattern, make sure you do to the back so that those side seams will still match up. Absolutely. And uh, as a lot of you know, we, we uh, film instructional classes uh, a lot of times at National Sewing Circle, and we're doing that actually next week. Both Nikki and I are doing classes, and one of the classes that will be filmed next week is all about pattern alterations, um, shirts and pants and skirts and all sorts of stuff. So pretty soon on the site, we'll have uh, an instructional class on that as well. Another question here from Roberta, and she says, how would I adjust a pattern to increase for bust and lengthen torso at the same time? Um, so, to increase for bust, uh, the, the general um, bust alteration is the, the full bust adjustment, or the FBA. Um, so there are a lot of great tutorials for that online with great pictures. Uh, the Curvy Sewing Collective has some great tutorials on that. Um, but you're just going to be um, you know, kind of, this is kind of the general, you're going to slash, um, along these lines and open things up and it's going to, to make your arms, I have a little bit of a, um, be a little bit of a sharper curve, but it'll give you more space in the middle here. And to lengthen your torso at the same time, you could, um, just, to carry this line all the way across and bring that down. So that would um, combine those alterations so you don't have to do one and then do the other. Um, but you see, make sure I have the curvy sewing collective. Gotta make sure I have the right web address for you there. So it's um, curvy sewing collective.com. And you can search full bust adjustment or FBA, and there's some great tutorials for that um, on that website. Well, you know, I've got to point out also that we have one on our website. Um, our friend Beth Bradley did a full bust adjustment tutorial, um, and that again is on National Sewing Circle. So I think, I mean, definitely good to to get uh, tips from multiple resources. Uh, even watch them both. You know, uh, it doesn't hurt to see if people do them differently. Absolutely. All right, our next question here is from Jan. She says, what is the best way of sewing a waistband with elastic? I want to sew through the elastic rather than making a casing so the elastic doesn't turn. Do I use a serger or a sewing machine? Um, I always use my sewing machine. So it's really easy to do with a sewing machine. Um, and actually, you can do like a faux casing. Um, but you're so you will be sewing through the elastic so the elastic won't twist in the casing so you can align the elastic on the wrong side of the waistband and with the the edges aligned um, the edge of the elastic line with the raw edge of the fabric 
um, and do a zigzag stitch right along that edge. And that attaches the elastic to the fabric so nothing is going to turn. Um, and then turn that to the wrong side again to um, encase the elastic. Um, quarter mark everything so your gathers will be uh, evenly distributed. And then you can actually straight stitch. Um, pull as you sew so that the, the elastic is the to the size of the, um, the skirt upper edge or the waistband, whatever you're sewing. Then you can just do a, a straight stitch um, to finish that off. And from the outside, it looks like a um, it looks like a casing, but it's stitched to the skirt, so it's not going to fold. You can also do um, like an exposed waistband. Um, uh, if that's not the look you're looking for, the, the faux casing would be the way to go. But um, an exposed waistband is also stitched right to the fabric, so there's no way that that elastic is going to turn either. And that's just um, putting the elastic on the right side of the skirt and stitching right along the edge with a zigzag stitch, and then you fold the elastic up and you're done. And that can be really fun with some fun colors of of elastic or prints of elastic that they make nowadays. But um, that faux casing is a really great technique. Um, it's one of my favorites to use when I'm inserting elastic uh, because it, it does give the look of a casing, but um, it's easier, I think, than trying to thread um, uh, thread elastic through a casing um, and also eliminates the problem of elastic turning in the casing. Absolutely. And we have one more question about elastic here, but I've, just if you look at, um, some commercial like store bought uh, sweatpants and stuff, they'll have that casing and then it's just the elastic is actually stitched on the side. So like just in two little spots. And so that keeps it from not rolling too. Um, but I will say I only learned that it was stitched there when I try to like replace the elastic and I can't pull it out. Yeah. So sometimes the casing is good if you, if you know you may eventually replace that elastic. But our other question about elastic is from Annette. She wants to know how you sew elastic onto a waistline that has no seam allowance and the elastic has to be applied to the edge of the waistline. So similar to what you were just saying. Yeah, yeah, the exposed waistband um, is a good um, kind of fix for that if you don't have enough seam allowance up at the top. Um, it'll just take like a little, like a quarter inch seam allowance um, off the top to do an exposed waistband. And you can even, um, if you don't want a lot of elastic showing at the top, um, use, a, you can use a thinner elastic. And um, so it'll be just, you know, this tiny little elastic strip um, at the top and it doesn't use much for seam allowance at all. Absolutely, and they even make, uh, it's called fold over elastic and it already has sort of that like, perforated, I guess, in the middle, so you know it's gonna be um, even when you fold it. Right, and that doesn't use, that wouldn't take any uh, seam allowance off your, your skirt at all. You would just fold that over the upper edge. Yep, that's a good point. Perfect. All right, our next question here is from Linda, and she wants to know if there are any easy ways to put in invisible zippers. Hers always seem to pucker at the end. Yeah, that, that pucker at the end, that's the hardest part, is finishing the seam below the invisible zipper. The invisible zipper itself, um, there's, I've only seen one way to put it in. You know, you don't sew, if it's in a skirt back, you don't sew the back seam first like you would with a regular zipper insertion. You leave the pieces separate, unzip your zipper, and um, place the zipper face down, right sides together with the, the skirt and you know, roll that coil out. You can use your regular zipper foot or they do make invisible zipper feet for that purpose. Um, I actually use a cording foot to put um, an invisible zipper in. Just anything that has that, those grooves on the underside for the coil um, to go under. And stitch as close as you can get to that coil. Um, do that on both sides. And then, yeah, the problem is then you've got to fold that, the end of the invisible zipper out of the way to stitch the rest of that seam and I leave my zipper foot on or if I've used a cording foot I'll put a zipper foot on to sew um, that seam because that allows you to get a little bit closer um, to the bottom of the zipper when you're finishing that seam um, but getting a pucker a lot of times will happen when you um, stitch um, your seam allowance isn't 
the same as the seam allowance you used for the zipper. So if you're in trying to get as close as you can to the bottom of that zipper, you may stitch a little bit of a wider seam allowance and that'll give you that pucker. So if you don't try to get so close to the end of the zipper, just concentrate on you know getting your seam allowance correctly, you can go back in with a hand sewing needle and um, stitch that um, if you've got a little gap between the bottom of the zipper and the beginning of your seam, stitch that with a hand sewing needle if you need to, but that can help with that pucker at the end of the invisible zipper, which I know exactly what you mean with that because I've done the same thing. All right, we have another zipper question since we're on the topic of zippers here. And Prisca wants to know how to install an invisible zipper on stretchy fabric. Yeah, zipper, <clears throat> zippers and stretchy things are kind of tough. Um, <clears throat> but you just, um, the, the insertion technique is the same, but you would want to interface your material to make sure that it doesn't really stretch and wobble out of shape. Um, but you would want to use a knit interfacing so that the, the drape and the hand of the fabric isn't changed. Um, so you just, you can cut yourself one inch strips for the length of the zipper. Um, and I would do it on the, the crosswise grain of the interfacing so it's not, it doesn't have the most stretch. Um, so whatever grain that the interfacing has the most stretch cut on the, cut across from that so that it will do its job and interface the fabric and make sure that the fabric doesn't stretch out. Um, but then the, the t technique for insertion would be the same, but that interfacing is really, really helpful for making sure that um, your fabric doesn't get all stretched out of whack before you even get the garment completed. Absolutely. All right, so we have some more questions here about patterns. Um, and someone wants to know what the easiest sleeve to draft and sew is. Um, I think the easiest sleeve would probably be like a drop sleeve um, where the, the shoulder seam is kind of down off of your shoulder because that can just be like a straight edge of the fabric. Um, there doesn't have to be a curve to it. There doesn't have to be a curve to the, the sleeve piece. It's just two straight circles sewn together. Um, but if you, that's generally seen on like sweatshirts and things uh, styles that are a little bit baggier. Um, if you want a closer fitting style, I actually think the raglan sleeve is uh, pretty easy to sew, and that's the one where um, the sleeve goes up and connects into your neckline. Um, and I just I cut the sleeve on the fold so that the fold is right on the top of the shoulder, and my uh, seam is on the under seam here. Um, and uh, I think that one's pretty easy to sew. You don't have any, you know, ease in the sleeve cap to to mess around with, um, but easy is also kind of a subjective term. Something that is easy for me might not be easy for somebody else. Um, but uh, those are my, I, I really like the raglan sleeve. I think that's really um, an easy one to do. Yeah, absolutely. We have another sleeve question here since we're talking about sleeves. Um, and Betsy wants to know if you prefer to sit in a sleeve or attach the sleeve cap to the bodice, then stitch the sleeve seam and side seam as one continuous seam. And when is one method better than the other? Totally. I totally have a favorite method. I love the, the flat sleeve insertion technique. So um, setting in the, the sleeve cap uh, before you sew the sleeve seam or the, the bodice side seam so that um, you stitch the, the sleeve into the arm side, and then all at once you can stitch underarm seam and the side seam. Um, it's just, it's um, combining steps. So instead of three seams, you're only sewing two seams, and I like that. Um, and it's especially helpful when you're sewing something where the arm side is kind of small and hard to get, you know, around the bed of your machine and hard to see. Um, Hard to make sure that you're not getting, you know, puckers um, in your sleeve cap. Make sure everything is eased in nicely. So, like a petite shirt or a kid's shirt, uh, doll clothes especially. Oh my goodness, I couldn't imagine that. Um, but anything that's kind of small, that flat sleeve insertion technique is um, really helpful. Um, and in um, fabrics that are kind of tightly woven, where it's harder to ease that extra fabric in, so like sewing a wool jacket easing is really easy but sewing something like a uh like a lawn blouse 
um, it's kind of tough to get those um, that sleeve eased in. So I just like having everything flat. You can see everything. Um, and I'm not just like crossing my fingers and hoping for the best under the needle. Um, so that is definitely far and away my favorite way to insert uh, a sleeve. And I will, I will second that as well as my favorite technique. And um, mostly because um, if you're going to do uh, finishing, so if you're going to do like a flat fell to finish the seam, it's way easier to get around the arm's eye if it's laying flat. Right. Yes. Totally. All right. Our next question here is from Jackie. And she says, hi, I would like to start doing some machine smocking. I don't own a pleater. What stitch length would I use and how far apart should I space the rows? Um, so smocking, I actually have not done that a lot. Maybe Ashley will have, um, some more tips, but smocking, I, um, elastic thread is really great for, for smocking and it's kind of easy to do. You don't need any, uh, extra feet or anything. You just need elastic thread and that you wind that around your bobbin and use just regular all purpose thread in the needle. Um, and I think a quarter inch apart is good for rows. Um, and with smocking and shearing, you've got to do, you know, a lot of rows to get the fabric to gather up like you want it to. Um, and, you know, sh shooting it with some steam will help everything gather up as well. Um, that would be that would be my advice. Use elastic yeah. thread. I don't know if Ashley has any other tips. Yeah, I, I was gonna say elastic thread too, because it's just it's so much easier because you you don't need anything special. You're using your regular presser foot. You can draw your lines directly on your fabric, and then it really is just straight sewing. So um, winding the elastic thread uh, might be the hardest part, just because it's by hand. But I mean that's really not too hard either. So yeah, I would definitely use elastic thread as well. And as far as the, the stitch length, um, uh, you do want to bump your stitch length up. Um, maybe not the, you might not need to go to the longest stitch length, but um, test it out and see what gives you the, um, the best um, gathering look that you're going for. Um, but you will want to bump your stitch length up quite a bit. Yep. And like, like she was saying, you have to do a couple rows uh, to actually get the fabric to start gathering so don't just do one row and think oh it's not working like try a few and then you'll start to see the fabric um, gather together a bit better all right our next question here is from jane and she says i want to make a bomber jacket out of some microfiber faux suede but i would like to machine embroider a design on it i have never embroidered clothing uh or with this material do you have any tips Ooh. Um, microfiber faux suede, the pile is probably not very tall, so I would say you can go ahead and just embroider right on top of it. Um, if the pile is a bit tall, you might want to like cut that away or shave it away so that the, the pile doesn't stick up through the threads. Um, that'd be my only advice for that, but otherwise I would say you could probably just go ahead and em embroider as normal with that kind of fabric. So if you've never embroidered on clothing before, maybe only done it on, say, like a pillow front or something, what's, what do you have to take into account that's different with clothing than like a home deck item? Um, clothing, you do have to consider uh, the drape of the fabric on your body. So just making sure that, um, that it is straight with the grain line. So the grain line of the fabric you want to make sure is straight up and down with the center line of the design. That'd be the the biggest thing probably and making sure that it's not in a weird spot so like not right on the apex of your bust um just making sure that it's a place kind of uh in a pleasing position on the body so i know a lot of logos are placed like up at the the upper right hand side of the bodice so that's a good placement um so yeah just kind of thinking about where it's going to sit when you're wearing the garment as well do you embroider on like a piece of fabric first and then cut out your pattern piece or do you cut your pattern piece and then embroider? Um, I um, embroider first and then place my pattern piece over it. Just it eliminates the, the possibility of um, it just there's a there's a wider margin for error <laughs> when you do it that way. Just making sure when you um, 
when you embroider on you know a big chunk of fabric making sure you've got enough space around it for the rest of your pattern piece but I feel like that is an easier way um, to place it just um, eliminate some possibility of you know things going awry which a lot of times they will I, I just thought of this too because you're talking about the pile of the suede do you have to worry about hoop burn or anything should you actually hoop it or should you drape it over the hoop and pin it in place um, with suede you may get you may get Hooper, and actually, I think that is one of the the fabrics. That's a good point. Um, yeah, things with pile will can sometimes the hooping it can damage it. So, um, really good point. Yeah, um, I would not hoop that fabric. I would lay it over top of the hoop, and you know, roll up the edges so that it can fit on there, and then clip it or temporary spray adhesive to get it to to hold down onto the hoop. That's a really good point, Ashley. Glad I thought of it. All right, my one good one for today. <laughs> okay, our next question here is from Lisa, and she wants to know what the best tutorial or class to learn how to copy patterns of ready-to-wear garments. Um, I don't know about the the best class out there for doing that. Um, you could probably Google uh, whatever article of clothing you want to copy the pattern from. I know tank tops is there's a ton of tutorials out there for copying. Um, your favorite tank top pattern onto onto paper for reusing. Um, Monica Bravo was on Sew It All TV as well, and she did the same thing. Um, she she pin traced a pair of panties to make yourself a pattern um, from a pair of panties that you already own. Um, so that's on SewItAllTV.com. Um, but if you type into your your search bar, uh, whatever clothing article you want to copy, if it's a pair of pants. Uh, how to copy ready to wear pants pattern or something along those lines and I guarantee there will be tutorials out there but um, as far as the best I'm not sure I could uh, could speak to that there's there's a lot out there absolutely I have to say when it comes to just any questions I know even questions I have are probably you too Nikki just searching something online um, is usually the the first thing I usually do yeah and there is somebody out there who has already asked that question, and the internet is a beautiful thing. Absolutely. All right, we have some more questions here about patterns, and Phyllis wants to know how she can make a v-neck on a dress without a collar. Um, so without a collar, um, so uh, I, I take that question to mean um, how to finish a v-neck on a dress without it attaching a collar. Um, so facing um, a v-neck is probably the easiest way to finish um, a v-neck line. You can just cut, um, if you have your, your v, so your neckline comes down to this point right here. Cut your v-neckline. Um, to make a facing, you would just trace uh, several inches three, four inches out, and there's your facing pattern. Just cut that in a separate piece, um, making sure that you've got a seam allowance at this edge to attach that facing. Um, so you just attach that around the V, turn it toward the inside, um, you know, clipping the seam allowance wherever you need to to get that to lay flat. And that's a really great way to, to finish a V neckline without having to add a collar or anything. Um, you can also add, you can bind a V neckline. Um, you can add some ribbing. Um, just at the point you'd have to, you know, um, at this point, as you pivot up to the other side, you would have to, um, you know, pinch a little bit of that fabric out on the wrong side and stitch um, to make that V in the ribbing or in the, the binding. Absolutely. All right. We have another question here, and I, I should have asked it earlier when we were talking about shearing, uh, but Connie says that she has trouble with shearing, and she would like to know um, what kind of adjustments she can make to machine settings that would help. Um, so stitch length, like we just talked about, make sure your stitch length is bumped up. Um, that just uh, bites more fabric with each needle stitch and um, helps gather the fabric up more. Um, I'm not sure about any tension adjustments that may need to be done. Um, the elastic thread is wound onto the bobbin, um, so it doesn't have to go through any tension discs or anything, so you shouldn't have to alter your needle tension. Um, 
but uh, your stitch length, um, yeah, it's shearing is, there's not much you have to do. Ashley, do you have any? I, I, the only thing is, um, we, I think we talked about this uh, even a couple of months ago, um, that it works better on um, front load bobbins sometimes than it does on drop-in bobbins, just because when you're putting it into the front load bobbin, you can actually get to put the bobbin into the casing. So if your elastic is coming out a little bit, you can adjust that, and it's a lot harder to make that adjustment on a top, a drop-in bobbin. Um, but so what we were talking about it before is, because uh, I have a drop-in bobbin on, I have three different machines and they all have the same bobbin, so I can't get away from it. But so I just have to have like a little piece of fabric that I sort of start stitching on first because it seems like the first inch yeah. unravels. Yep. Yeah. So it's like I get going and then it actually starts working. So just having that little scrap helps. That's a good tip. And on most machines, um, uh, when winding the elastic thread on the bobbin, on most machines you don't have to put a lot of tension um, you want to do it by hand and just put kind of very, very slight tension on the thread as you're winding it. There are some machines that do want you to wind it on the machine. Um, I couldn't tell you which ones, but I've just heard heard tell some machines want you to do that. So you can try it both ways and see, um, see what works out for you. Um, shearing will also work best on fabric that is lighter weight. So if um, you're trying to do shearing on like a corduroy or a bottom weight and you're wondering why it's not working, what's wrong with my machine, um, it's the fabric. You want to use something lighter weight, uh, a lightweight cotton, and shearing on one layer is always better than two layers because anything lighter is going to gather and bunch up a lot better. Um, so those are yeah. my shearing tips. And I, one more question here, and this is from Helen, and she says, when working with elastic thread, what kind of needle do you use? So I just want to make sure we stress that it doesn't go through the needle. Right, yeah, you can use your universal needle because the elastic thread doesn't go through the needle at all. It's wound onto the bobbin. Um, so universal needle, uh, all-purpose thread in the needle, and the elastic thread comes up uh, from the underside of the machine from the bobbin. Absolutely. All right, our next question here is from Mary, and she says, is it true that threads weaken in storage? I recently talked with a sewing machine tech about the incorrect stitching my old singer was doing, and he suggested I try a brand new thread to see if that made a difference. That's a good question, and that was always one of the very first things that I would do when I was getting thread breakage is, oh, this thread is old, throw it away. Um, but unless your thread was stored in direct sunlight in a really humid environment, thread will last a really long time. So make sure your thread is, is stored um, away from the sun and um, somewhere dry. Um, <clears throat> and yeah, it, it can last, you know, 20, 30 years, I think. So that's typically not going to be your problem when you're getting thread breakage. As I was going to say, I'm pretty sure my mom still has probably the same spool of thread she taught me how to sew on. Yeah. So like you really can use them for a long time. But I do know like if you know that um, you left your thread out and it's been sitting in the sun and it might be dry, they, they make products. Uh, thread Heaven is one of them and it's, it's like a silicone. Uh, it comes in a little bottle and you just, you just run a line of it on your thread and it sort of moisturizes it uh, and can help if you're having thread breakage. Um, so something to bring some life into some old thread if you need to. Cool, I didn't know that. Yeah, so our next question here, uh, back to more sewing machine issues. And uh, our next question is from Glenda, and she says, what makes the sewing machine not up at the presser foot? It's all knotted up and the material actually gets stuck underneath the presser foot. Yeah, so, um, when the material gets all bunched up and knotted up, that says to me that um, a lot of times that'll happen when you're using lighter weight fabric. And if you try stitching right from the very edge of the fabric, um, sometimes your your fabric will get shoved down into your throat plate and it'll get caught up in all those mechanisms and you'll get a big thread nest with it as well. And it's just not a pretty picture. Um, so my suggestion is always to start a couple of stitches in from the edge and then backstitch one or two and then carry on with your seam. Um, if it is still happening, um, 
with really like slinky knit sometimes or really like chiffon, something very, very lightweight and thin. Um, if that is still happening, you can try putting some tissue paper under that, the beginning of your seam, and that'll help uh, stabilize it some, hopefully, so that it won't get shoved down. Also, a, a single stitch throat plate, um, instead of having a, a wide hole to accommodate a zigzag, the throat plate will have only one hole, so you can only do a straight stitch on it. Don't try to do a zigzag, you'll break your needle. Um, but having a smaller area, for the needle to go through will sometimes um, <clears throat> prevent the fabric from being pushed down um, into the throat plate and getting all gunked up down there. Um, and the thread nest is probably a result of, of that, of your, your fabric getting pushed under, but some of the things that we talked about um, a little bit ago uh, for thread nest, making sure it's threaded correctly, um, and that checklist um, can help with that as well. Absolutely. And I do know uh, with that, that single stitch throat plate, um, with my machine, when I automatically turn it on, like my needle position is over here and I have to move it to the middle. So if you have that um, throat plate on, make sure your needle's in the right spot. Right. <laughs> All right. One last question here uh, and then we're about out of time. But Bev wants to know why her machine jumps stitches in some knit fabrics using either single or twin needles and how do I avoid this from happening? Right, to skip stitches will happen. Um, first of all, make sure your everything is threaded correctly, everything is clean. That's a lot of times one of the major issues um, in tension and skip stitches and everything. Um, <clears throat> if your um, if your presser foot is not exerting enough pressure on your fabric, so if you've got a really thin fabric, sometimes your presser foot is not um, holding the fabric. Um, clamping it down enough and your needle will kind of thunk, thunk, thunk through the fabric and the fabric kind of does this thing on your, on the bed of the machine that can cause to get skipped stitches. So um, adding some tissue paper under there can uh, help stabilize that and help that go through under the needle. Um, that can sometimes help. Um, if you have the wrong kind of needle for your fabric, that can sometimes cause skip stitches. So with knits, you want to make sure you've got a ballpoint needle. Um, that try that that can help you should have a ballpoint needle for your knits for the, the health of your knit fabric anyway um, and that may help with the skip stitches as well um, if you have the wrong combination of um, needle size and thread size and also um, like needle size and fabric size uh, it's kind of a delicate balance. How do we get anything done? Everything has to be perfect. Um, if your thread is too large for your the eye of your needle, that can cause skip stitches because the needle will have a harder time going through your fabric. And as it goes under into the throat plate and down by the bobbin mechanism, that um, the bobbin thread isn't going to catch um, around the the needle fabric if the needle is having a hard time going through the fabric. So for the same reason, if you have a dull needle, that will cause cause skip stitches. So make sure you have um, a new needle, um, the right size needle for your thread. Um, and if you're using a lighter weight fabric, make sure you're using um, maybe a smaller size needle. Um, that can sometimes help if you've got too big of a, a bulky needle for your fabric. Um, sometimes that will cause an array of issues, skip stitches being one of them. Um, sometimes skip stitches are just uh, if your machine is really old, sometimes you've got worn thread guides and paths, um, and that can cause skip stitches, but that's kind of rare and only if your machine is uh, really pretty old. Um, poor quality thread can do it. Um, uh, so make sure you've got a, a good thread um, that you're working with. Um, hopefully going through that checklist will help, but I know one of the major things is uh, a dull needle and having the right um, size of needle both for your thread and your fabric. So give that a try and hopefully that will help. Absolutely. And I feel like that's sort of the first two things to try on um, any stitch issue, sewing machine issue is your thread and your needles. It's, it's usually one of those two. Yeah. All right. Well, I want to thank everyone who joined us, uh, either submitted their questions beforehand, submitted their questions live, anyone who is just listening along. I hope you learned a lot and we hope you tune in next month as well for our next live event. Uh, so thank you so much for being here.